Hey, it's Greg Otten here, and this is an episode from the very first season of the Maritime Gardening Podcast. I've been doing this for a number of years now, and you can listen to the current season at my podcast website, uh, maritimegardening.com. It's completely free. Uh, but I thought I'd put the older episodes, uh, start putting the older episodes up on my YouTube channel for people that just prefer to consume online content in that way. So we'll give that a try, and if people seem to be enjoying it, I'll keep doing it. And if you really enjoy it, you can go to my website, maritimegardening.com, and listen to any one of the episodes I've ever done or the current season. So have a listen. You're listening to the MaritimeGardening.com podcast, episode 13. Hey there, thanks for tuning in to episode 13 of the MaritimeGardening.com podcast. Uh, I'm Dave Doggett, and once again, we are joined with our show host, Greg Otten. How you doing, Greg? Oh, hello. I'm doing fine. Excellent, excellent. So uh, we're going to be talking about perennials today, I gather? That's right. Okay. Perennials in your in your vegetable food perennials, not Food not hostas and right, uh, daylilies, right. but food perennials, perennials you eat. Yeah, well, anybody who's been listening to the show for any length of time has a pretty good idea that most of what's covered is primarily related to food. 99%. 99%, but I'm sure there's <laughs> many of the uh, techniques that you use could easily spill over. Oh, yeah. 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 So don't, uh, don't let that scare you off if you're not eating from your garden. But, this show's all about healthy soil. If you got right. healthy soil, you can grow anything in it. There you go. There you healthy, go. Healthy, balanced soil. Anything grows in it. Nice, nice. All right, let her go. All right. So perennials. I guess the first question is why grow them? I, I didn't. When I was growing up, um, I think of the perennials that my parents would have had in the garden. The only thing that comes to mind is rhubarb. Yep. Right? There's a perennial that like most people would have had traditionally especially in the Maritimes. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if, if you if you were in a survival situation, you wouldn't want to have to live on rhubarb. <laughs> <laughs> no, I guess you could probably, but no. I mean, the leaves are literally poisonous. So. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess that could help you in a survival situation if yeah. you had to poison someone. <laughs> poison an enemy. <laughs> you could use it as a weapon. It's a handy poison yeah. uh, for <laughs> situations that warrant poisoning. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think there's arsenic in it or something. <laughs> anyway, I haven't looked into it too too yeah. closely. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> um, anyway, there's lots of other things you can grow. And, uh, I mean, you can broaden that out too, not just vegetables, but various kinds of fruit-bearing bushes or fruit-bearing trees, right? Yeah. So... Now, why would you grow them? Well, the first question is, or the first answer is, because when you plant a perennial, you're never going to have to plant that thing again, right? Awesome. So it's easy. You, you plant it, and then it just keeps giving you food every year until, I mean, some of them have a, a finite life, maybe mm-hmm. 10 or 15 years. Asparagus is supposed to last 15, 20 years, and then they get exhausted. That's still a lot of asparagus. Yeah. Um, but it's worth it. Yeah. And most of these things, they get better every year. The roots get deeper, the plant gets stronger, it's right. adapting to your soil conditions and so on. And of course, you're going to, most most perennials, you're going to do something every year to sort of, you know, you're going to put that mulch on. So mulch right. just has a way of making soil better every year anyway. So the perennials will just get better, stronger, and greater yields every year. Yeah. So why would you do it? Well, number one, it's way easier. Mm-hmm. And any other kind of it's, it's a perfect sort of you know permaculture gardeners love perennials because it's just like again, again we're copying the forest right right and everything in the forest <laughs> a lot of things in the forest are pretty perennial right they're yeah. around all the time um, so it's perfect right the mm-hmm. roots get really deep uh, your perennials never seem to suffer when it's dry or you know when you're planting annuals and things like that when they're seedlings you have to really sort of carry them along even with a good mulch and you know, mm-hmm. until you can close that mulch around the stems of the plants you got to be conscious of the water level in the soil the moisture level in the soil yeah the perennials never <laughs> they just grow the, the roots have gotten so deep and so mature 
you can just leave them alone. They're right. fine. You right. don't water. You don't go around watering rhubarb. No. Right? no. Why would you? No. It's, it's, the roots are huge, right? That's right. They'll take care of it. Um, so they're number one ease of maintenance. Mm-hmm. Right. They're made for people that can't stand all the tedious parts of gardening because they're the opposite of all you do with perennials is eat them. Uh, so that's handy. But the other reason is because if you think of it like an investment, right? I can't think of an investment. You know, I used to work for the government and a good investment will give you a five-year return, right? Mm-hmm. You put the money down and in five years you, you sort of make that back in savings or something and then everything yeah. after that's gravy. gravy that's yeah. a good investment. Yeah. Well, perennials, usually the investment, you make it back in the, the season, right? Yeah. You get and over time, you just get more and more back, so you're going to get a ridiculous uh, return. So, you know, I just did a little bit of math here on a spreadsheet. I don't want to bore everyone to death, so I'll keep this short. <laughs> um, uh, I just did some math on strawberries. So for about 12 bucks, if you go to a, a garden center, you can get 20 bare root strawberry plants. Yeah. And 20 bare root strawberry plants will give you two 10-foot rows of strawberries, mm-hmm. maybe more. Um, but in my mind, when I think of when I put my strawberry bed in, that's about the amount of strawberries plants I had. That's about the area of that yeah. initial, my initial, stra- I got more strawberries now. Right. I'll talk about that in a bit. But, um, so I was looking up online yield per plant, yield, yield per this, yield per that. Cause you know, every plant's got a certain yield mm-hmm. and I was looking at all the numbers and finding numbers that sort of sound right to me based on. No, I don't measure how many liters of strawberries I get a year, but I have a crude idea of how many strawberry plants. Right. So I grow ever-bearing strawberry plants. They're not the heaviest yielding of strawberries, but they yield perpetually. So yeah. I like having I like having that sweet fruit available from yeah. June until late October. Right. Right. You get a good yield in, in June, and then a bowl of strawberries a week all summer long, and then a pile of strawberries in October. Hmm. That's where you make all your jam, right? Yeah. Um, so that's really handy for me. And so even though the overall yield isn't the same as June bears, which do everything in, in sometime in June or maybe even early July, and then they're done for the season, yeah. um, they yield heavier. But um, I like the ever bears because you sort of get them all the time. Yeah, that sounds So good. it's like having a grocery store in your backyard, right? Yeah. Uh, and it's nice having a fruit source in your garden. Yeah. Um, but if you look at those, they say that, you know, half a pound per foot of row is what you can expect. June bears, you can get up to almost a pound per foot. Mm. So I'm talking about uh, ever bears now. So half a pound, it's a good rule of thumb. Uh, unless you had a really bad year or something. Let's just, let's just assume you've got, you've got good soil and, you're, you know, it's, it's a reasonably good. I mean, I had a bad year last year because a porcupine ate all of my strawberry plants down to the ground. <laughs> so not a very good yield last no. year. It ate all of them. Yeah. There was nothing left. But they came back. I didn't have to replant them. They're, okay. they're growing fine this year. Mm-hmm. Um, so my initial garden, uh, I had two 10-foot rows of strawberries. Mm-hmm. Now, I paid ten do- uh, $12 to get the strawberry, bare root strawberries. Mm-hmm. And the first year you put strawberries in, you don't get a ridiculous yield. You get I get a lot of strawberries. I got enough to make jam in the fall. Right. Um, but your second year, you get way more. And your third year, you get even more than that. Um, so these numbers, half a pound per foot of row, is based on the second and third year, not the first year. Right. So, okay. uh, so I've, done, I've, I've, I've halved that for the first year. Mm-hmm. So with that garden, two 10-foot rows, so that was a, a bed that was you know, four feet by 10 feet. In the first year, I got five pounds of strawberries. Second year, I got you know. Second year and every year onward, ten pounds of strawberries. Mm-hmm. Right now, if you assume that a pound of strawberries, which is about a quart of strawberries, is three bucks, and it can range. Right when they're yeah. really on, when they're on sale, they can be a buck ninety nine. If you buy them on the, uh, if you go up out where I am, there's someone on the side of the road selling them for five ninety nine yeah. pound. <laughs> um, so anyway, I'm basing these numbers on two ninety nine a pound, so three bucks yeah. just to keep the math simple. Yeah. So the first season, I spent twelve dollars. I got fifteen bucks worth of strawberries. So right there, one year return on investment. Yeah. The second season, I didn't spend anything, and I got thirty dollars worth of strawberries. Right, ten pounds. Yeah. And every season after that. So after five years, 
I had 135 bucks worth of strawberries from my initial $12 investment in strawberry plants. Pretty hard to get that anywhere. Yes, that is a $123 profit and a 1,025% profit. <laughs> so yeah. eat that, stock market. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's true. That's the 123 divided by 12. Yeah. Um, that's the profit, right? Yeah. Oh, that's that's good money. It is. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> that's exciting. That's, the, that's what you want. And we're going to do a show on more sort of stuff like that. Like, you yeah. know, you spend two bucks on a pack of seeds. Sure. How much veg, you know, how much food value do you get out of that? Yeah, what's realistic? Yeah. Um, cuz I I think that's you know, I don't know why people don't think that way. People always think about gardening in a sort of, oh, it's a nice hobby and I'm outside and getting mm. exercise. This is all true. But, I mean, man, it's it's food. It's food yeah. you don't have to buy. You yeah. should always bear that in mind. Yeah, and it just keeps going up and up and up. I mean, I even in the last 6 to 12 months, it's extremely noticeable at the grocery store. As the price of oil goes up, and I don't want to sound like some sort of alarmist, yeah. or whatever, but as the price of oil goes up, and it, it, it can only go up because there's We're only running so out. Everybody yeah. wants more, yeah. and all the places that never needed oil before now want cars and oil. So, yeah. uh, if, if oil is what gets the food to your grocery store, then your food's going to cost more. Oh yeah. So uh, you don't need any oil to walk into your backyard, other than you know a little bit of olive oil. <laughs> <laughs> good one. Good one. Good one. <laughs> um, so, yeah, which you have to import. There's no olive trees in Nova Scotia. In, in yeah, Nova yeah, Scotia. that's right. Uh, but anyway, we got lots of canola, I suppose. <laughs> so that's why you would want perennials. It's so easy to to sort of get going and maintain. You know, you might look at the initial price. Oh, geez, I got to spend that. You know, because you're looking at the pack of seeds, yeah. then you're looking at the ten dollar, twelve dollar thing of strawberries. Right. But just bear in mind that you're, you know, that's going to keep growing for the rest of your life. Yeah. I mean, there's little things. Every three years, you got to let your strawberry runners produce new plants. Strawberries have babies. Right. And, uh, but the other thing you can do with strawberries, so you, you buy those, and this is what I did. You get these initial 12 plants. Every year, your strawberries put these things called runners out, these long sort of stems that don't yep. look like the other stems. And those stems sort of arch out, and then they touch down on the ground, and they try to create a new strawberry plant. Hmm. So when you're seeing that happen... Once that runner starts to put out roots into the soil, you can just pick that up, cut it off from the main plant, and stick it in the ground somewhere else. Mm. And next year, that next year or the year after that, that'll be a productive strawberry plant. Nice. Um, so, your strawberries make other strawberry plants mm. within a one year. You know. Wow. So and and every three years you have to do that because the original plant loses vigor. So every three years you have to let that new plant take over. But there's a really that sounds complicated. There's a really easy way to do that. And I'll talk about that in another show. Yeah. Um, but some people think it's difficult managing strawberries and runners and stuff like that. It isn't. Um, if you just uh, think ahead and and use a couple tricks. Nice. Uh, yeah. So that's why you do perennials. It's worth the money. Mm. But so what are what varieties? What what sort of perennials you know can I grow? Um, and let me just you know I forgot to define. I was going to do a bit of defining here because what is a perennial, right? We get yeah. three kinds of plants. You've got annuals, biennials, and perennials. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about perennials. Uh, annuals are plants that go through their entire life cycle in a season. Mm -hmm. The seed germinates, grows into a plant. The plant makes a flower. The flower gets fertilized, the flower makes seeds, the whole plant dies, the seed's the only thing that's left at the end of the season, and if that seed doesn't generate, that's uh, yeah. German, that's the end of that plant's yeah. family tree forever. Yeah. Um, so annuals, all that's left after one season is the seed. Mm. Um, biennials, the plant has a two-year life cycle. It, it's the first year it grows and gathers energy and gets a huge root, and the second year it tends to shoot up some sort of long stem, and that stem will have a flower. And uh, that flower, in the second year, that flower will produce seeds. Okay. And then in year three, it's the seed that starts a new plant. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, carrots and uh, parsnips are biennial. Kale, okay. Swiss chard, they're biennial. Yeah. Uh, onions and garlic, they're biennial. They take mm -hmm. two years to sort of do their life cycle. Mm -hmm. Right now, I've got parsnips in my garden that are about three feet high with all these flowers on them. Oh, yeah. Same with my kale. My kale from some a couple of my kale from last year. I let I just left them in the garden, and they're like three feet high. Hmm. And they put these weird sort of bean-like pods out, um, and you let that sort of dry out a bit. 
I don't know, sometime in August when it starts looking like you can hear the seeds rattling oh, around yeah. the pots and you cut the plant off and hang it upside down somewhere and let it dry. But and there's your seeds. So I've got like a million kale seeds back nice. there. Um, and the same thing with the parsnips. And the parsnips tend to have a poor germination root anyway, so it's great having mm. tons of parsnip seeds. Mm-hmm. So that's a biennial. And then you've got your perennial. It's just a plant that just keeps, you know, it's it's it, it's it's a, it's a living thing. Nothing lives forever. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know what the but whatever the life cycle of a perennial plant is, um, yours is worse. <laughs> 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 Generally speaking, you know, they're going to yeah. be around when you're gone. Yeah. You know? Um, uh, with the exception of asparagus, where I've read it's only like fifteen or twenty years. Okay. Even that, I mean, if I'm still around in twenty years, uh, yeah. I'll be happy to get new asparagus. You yeah. know, there'll <laughs> <laughs> be high fives all around it. Yeah. That's what I have. <laughs> uh, so you know, that's your 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 perennials. They just keep coming back, and they keep growing, and they keep getting bigger. Yeah. So some varieties. Um, you got your rhubarb, which you already mentioned. Lovage, which I mentioned in a previous yeah. episode, things your parents never grew. Yeah. Um, Lovage is a plant that's sort of like a celery, a celery parsley sort of flavor. It's you'd use it with things. It's a you'd use it to accent flavors. If you want that yeah. celery for a flavor in something or yeah. sharpness, you add it. But it, that thing can get to six feet high. Mine was maybe five, you know, maybe a foot high the first year I planted it. Mm. That was last year, yeah. and this year it's. You know, almost three feet high. Wow. So next year, I assume it's going to be four or five feet high. Mm, you know? cool. And yeah. I just have it planted underneath my apple tree. And oh, apparently, yeah. that'll put out seeds, too, so I could have more. But nice. from what I've read, they said, you know, one lovage plant's on. How many celery-flavored dishes do you make? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, it's was... not using celery like, you you know, you have with peanut butter and cream and cheese whiz right. and stuff. It's just celery flavor. Actually, just... I, you're making me hungry. I'm hungry anyway. I must be if I'm salivating over celery. <laughs> uh, but that was episode eight for anybody who wants so, to look that up. Um, uh, so, uh, lovage, rhubarb, asparagus is another mm, one. Asparagus like takes a... a number of years to get going, so yeah. be patient, right? Yeah. I planted asparagus a couple of years ago, and I've, I planted it, you know, with... Lots of manure and everything, yeah. and um, it's still not the asparagus I planted this year. It looks a lot. Uh, the asparagus I planted last year yeah. looks much better this year, but it's still not ready to harvest. Yeah. Yeah. So it's going to take two, three, four years, depending on your soil, um, for that. You know, you usually buy them in little bags, and they're these little teeny asparagus. You can plant them from seed too, but that's going to take even longer. Yeah. So you can buy them already slightly started. They'll be like a little asparagus with a root. Mm. Those cost more, but you're speeding things up. That's going to save you a year or so. Okay. Um, or you can plant the seeds, and that's going to take even longer. Uh, but and once they get going, each of those plants that you bought is going to become a head, and it's going to have more than one asparagus tip mm. coming out of it. So mm-hmm. each of those heads, you don't take all the tips, but you take the, uh, you take the ones that uh, – mm. you take a number from each head. Right. You gotta let some grow, and they become this big sort of fern tree looking thing. Yeah. yeah. My my previous property, I had asparagus there, and it was just they never even made it into the house. Mm. Uh, my wife. <laughs> said, yeah. Why do you eat those? It's like, well, if you want them, you eat them. Uh, yeah, yeah. I just be out in the garden and oh, there's one. <laughs> eat it. Um, they're really, really good when you get them fresh. Nothing like from the store. The, the store ones are dry and woody by compare, com- comparison. Mm. They're fresh from your garden. They're they're sweeter, they're moister, they're softer, they're just warm. Awesome. I'll have to try that. But it's going to, you plant those, it's going to take a number of years, so be patient. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this is one, I'm just talking about vegetables here. Um, I've never tried, I just I was reading about um, the other day when I was preparing for the show, and I want to try this. It's called a Jerusalem artichoke. Mm-hmm. And if anyone uh, listening has planted this or has experience with it, um, I'd love for you to write something in the comments yeah. section because apparently this plant, it, it grows a root that um, uh, you eat the root. It, oh. it, it, it creates a flower. It's a sunflower-like plant from what I've read. That's, uh, it creates this big six-foot-high plant with this flower on the top. Mm. But there's also these rhizomes, these roots, potato-like roots under the ground and it produces more than one per plant once the plant's mature, I guess. Mm-hmm. So you can go under there and you can take you can't take all of them because you got to leave some for the next right. year. 
but they're they're indigenous to this area in North America, um, and I've seen them for sale at Kent, and I didn't know what it was, so I was like, I don't know about that. Forget it. Wow. Um, I, I think they're supposed to be hardy to zone three or something, so we're right. fine there. Or zone four, um, but I mean, what a great plant to have something that uh, apparently it's potato like, but it's sweeter. You can eat them raw or cooked. Okay. So it's obviously obviously sweeter than potato. Yeah. You'd put them along the sort of edge of your garden because they get so high. And those flowers that they, they produce bring in a lot of uh, pollinators like oh, bees yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. So there's, it sounds like a great thing all around aside from the fact that you plant them once and they keep coming back. Yeah. Um, they're perpetual, right? They're, mm. It's perpetual food. Mm. So, and it's supposed to be a good tasting root. Right? I guess the, you know, the uh, various First Nations... Um, uh, people here were harvesting them long before, mm. you know, uh, the Europeans came on the right. scene. So, uh, Interesting. yeah, it's definitely if they were using it, uh, it's it's a, a great food, you know. Yeah. So those are vegetables, but there's also fruits, right? You got your your sort of you know you got your strawberries, like I mentioned. Um, they're perennial and they're, I mean, great value for money, as I explained. Um, yeah. You get raspberries, blackberries. It's in, in a garden. It's good to have all of those things because you're. If you want to have, remember, fruit is like a vitamin C, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, aside from just the fact that it tastes great. Yeah. Uh, but if you have strawberries, raspberries, blackberries, blueberries, there's an order to all those things, right? Mm. So strawberries tend to come in early, and then. Um, it switches over. Once the strawberries are just finishing up, your raspberries start becoming edible. Yeah. So you've got that. And then once the raspberries start giving up and they're they're all gone, you've got your blueberries. Mm-hmm. And then once they start giving up, you've got your blackberries. Yeah. So, I mean, you can plant, you know, I've got other things, you know, elderberries and mm-hmm. all these other, they're really sort of jam things. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't sit out, you wouldn't mm-hmm. sit there on the ground and eat elderberries <laughs> like you Really, you know, unless you'd done something bad and you wanted to, you know, do a penance, <laughs> eating elderberries as penance, it tastes horrible. Um, but they make a wonderful jam. It's yeah. kind of fun how that works. Or what's the other one? People, oh, do you plant gooseberries? Gooseberries, right? I used to have them. I I couldn't stand them. Mm. Um, they've got the, you got to even to make a jam, you got to run them through a strainer to get the seeds, and yeah. they've got to have this little spike on them. Yeah, some people love it though. I know. It's yeah. like, yeah. Uh, if I had to choose that, you know, the things I listed here, they're all ahead on the list. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Strawberry, raspberry, blackberry, blueberry. Yeah. Um, and I'm out of room, which is fine because I don't need the gooseberry. Them, right. I'm fine. With that. I'm sure it makes a wonderful jelly. That's yeah. all I've ever heard you do with them is make a blueberry jelly right. or a, a gooseberry, gooseberry jelly. jelly. Um, but um, so those are again perennials. They're going to keep coming back. They're going to keep mm. you know, that root is just going to keep sending up new plants. So it's worth the money because it's mm. going to keep. Giving Return it to you. on your investment. And also uh, trees, right? I never thought of this growing up, but yeah. apple tree, pear tree, plum yeah. tree, cherry tree. You know, sure, you spend 50 bucks for an apple tree, um, but, you, you know, once. Once, it's, once it's happy and once it's producing, you're going to get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars worth of, yeah. the, like, beautiful, fresh, moist, tasty, non-irradiated, yeah. non-pesticided yeah, yeah, <laughs> apples. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And they're going to be fresh right there. And the beauty of an apple tree or any of these sort of trees is you can pick everything as it's ripening, right? right. Like the apple, right. when the apple's ready to fall off the tree, generally speaking, that's when it's at its height of flavor. Yeah. They don't pick them like that at the orchard because no. they, they can keep very long, no. right? They've no. got to pick them a bit early. So yeah. you can pick everything at it. You know, you plant the amount that's just right for you or your family, right? How much yeah, do yeah. I? Um, but you can pick them when they're when they're ripe, when they're just ready to be eaten. So everything's going to taste Perfect. really good. And and chances are, if they're if you're picking them when they're ready to be eaten, you're also picking them at the height of their um, you know n- nutrient value, mm. the, their, their nutritiousness. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So it's better for you. Yeah. Right? So yeah. it all yeah. dovetails and works out really well yeah. when you sort of get your start planning your garden. Nice. So you've got all these different perennials coming in and. You know, like asparagus is one of the first things that comes up in your garden. So you're, you've been all winter long. You've sort of starved for fresh greens that aren't from halfway around the world. Yeah. And, uh, there's your there's your asparagus coming up out of the ground. Oh, so wonderful. Nice. Right? Let me know when you need a hand uh, taste testing. 
<laughs> and I guess it, it bears mentioning that, you know, even though annuals and perennials aren't, aren't perpetual, I mean, they, they are in a sense because if you're getting heirloom varieties, they're producing seeds. Yeah. So your annuals, if they're producing seeds within a season, like a tomato plant, if you get a, an heirloom tomato like a um, brandywine tomato, I've got those in my garden. Yeah. I don't have to buy any more, right? Awesome. Pick the plant that did the best yeah. and I take a couple of those tomatoes and I get the seeds out and dry them out a bit and store them somewhere and that's my tomatoes for next year. I could put, I could put aside a thousand seeds if I mm. wanted to. Mm-hmm. Um, and same with your perennials. You know, it just takes a little bit of foresight to leave a couple really good, like this year I'm going to leave, again, I'm going to leave parsnips in the ground. And from the, I've never done this before, but this year I'm going to leave, I, I got a, a variety, I think it's called Nantes Scarlet, but a mm-hmm. variety of uh, carrot that's, mm-hmm. that's um, uh, heirloom. Right. So I'm going to leave a couple of the bigger carrots that have the nice long to- shape, leave them in the ground. Mm-hmm. And so next, you know, Next August, next year, in August 2017, I'll get the seeds from that carrot. Yeah. But I'll get a zillion seeds off one plant. It's nice. incredible the amount of seed. And the other cool thing is it just gives your garden a nice appearance because when nothing's – those uh, biennials, they start growing before anything. Mm. Well, you've got – your garden's just a wasteland. It's still too cold for anything to happen. And you've got something a foot or two feet high growing and growing and growing. Yeah. Yeah. And just as um, some of your plants, like my tomatoes are flowering right now, right? Mm-hmm. So I need things to come along and help those flowers out. Yeah. yeah. But I've got these huge parsnip flowers and huge kale flowers and you know a number of uh, biennials that are left in the ground. And all kinds of uh, flies and bees and stuff are coming in because they see that, right? It's, it's mm-hmm. the right in the middle of the garden is... Big yeah. yellow and bees like yellow, these big white and yellow flowers standing out in the middle of nowhere. So everything's coming in to get some of that nectar. Nice. And of course, while they're there, they might, you know, catch the tomatoes out of their corner, right? And go to work on that. Mm. So, the, you know, the, again, that helps your garden out. It helps draw in beneficial things to your garden that are going to help out other plants. Uh, so, excellent. Yeah. And Very. aside from the fact that you don't have to buy that stuff, you know, you're, yeah. you're saving a buck 99, but. But hey. even though you're saving a buck ninety nine, you're you might you're getting a better seed because you're getting a seed that grew from a plant that was successful in your soil in your yard. Yeah. So it's you're sort of selectively breeding breeding your own race. Success. Yeah. <laughs> you're creating a super plant. Creating your own super super plant for your conditions. It might not do well somewhere. You yeah. might give your seeds to someone else and right. it's no good. Right. Right. Their soil's different or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you never know with that sort of thing. Because they're not using mulch. <laughs> <laughs> never know. Well, you never know. You never know. Certainly anything grown in a permaculture garden likes yeah. consistent moisture levels in the well, soil. Well, that would make sense. Food. Yeah, that makes but sense. But what doesn't like that? Yeah, exactly. Awesome. That was uh, another good episode. Very informative and uh, exciting because who doesn't like to save money and eat good food? That's right. Free food for life. Perennials. Awesome. Well, that was uh, episode 13. You can find it at maritimegardening.com slash 013. Feel free to leave comments directly on the website. Uh, We have a voicemail button there as well. Uh, You can join in the uh, discussion on Facebook, which is facebook.com slash maritimegardening. And I think that's it. Catch us on iTunes, Stitcher, any other major podcast network. You can Google the name of the show. You'll find us pretty well any, anyhow, anywhere. So uh, thanks again, Greg. And uh, thanks for listening, everyone. And we'll see you on episode 14. Thank you. See you right. next time. Take care. Bye-bye.